Oh, yes. Yeah. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming. I am going to be demonstrating the catch box, which we will be using later on for questions. Apparently, it can be thrown from person to person. And you just speak into the black circle, as I am doing now. Um, I want to start by thanking Ben Secunda. Are you here, Ben? There's Ben in the back. Um, the NAGRA project manager in OVPR for helping the Museum Studies program with our speaker's invitation and arrangements for her visit and for reaching out to our many co-sponsors. I also want to thank the generous co-sponsors of this evening's lecture, the Department of American Culture, the Eisenberg Institute for Historical Studies, the LSNA Great Lakes Theme Semester, the Native American and Indigenous Student Interest Group, the Native American Studies Program, the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, the Program in Science, Technology, and Society, also known as STS, the University of, Mus of Michigan Museum of Anthropological Archaeology, and the Office of the Vice President for Research. The Museum Studies Program and many of our co-sponsors acknowledge the university's origins in a land grant from the Anishinaabe, including Odawa, Ojibwe, and Budawanami, and Wyandotte. And we further acknowledge that our university stands, like almost all property in the United States, on lands obtained generally in unconscionable ways from indigenous peoples. Knowing where we are changes neither the past nor the present. However, through scholarship and pedagogy, we work to create a future in which the past is thoroughly understood and the present supports human flourishing and justice while enacting an ethic of care and compassion. In that spirit, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Margaret Bruchak. Dr. Bruchak is Associate Professor of Anthropology, Coordinator of Native American and Indigenous Studies, and Associate Faculty in the Penn Cultural Heritage Center at the University of Pennsylvania. She is also a consultant to the Center for Native North, I'm sorry, the Center for Native American and Indigenous Research at the American Philosophical Society and the director of Wampum Trail, a restorative research project designed to reconnect wampum belts in museum collections with their related indigenous communities. Dr. Bruchak is co-editor of Indigenous Archaeologies, a Reader in Decolonization. Her new book, Savage Kin, Indigenous Informants and American Anthropologists, thank you for holding that up, was the winner of the 2018 Council for American Anthropology, Museum Anthropology Book Award. And I will guarantee you that, that this award is well-earned and well-deserved. It's a fabulous book. Tonight, Dr. Bruchak will discuss strategies for recovering indigenous object histories through material analysis, consultation, and reassessments of imposed museological categories that may have distanced objects from their origins. She will reveal how memories can be reawakened when otherwise mysterious objects are reconnected with the stories, ecosystems, and communities that created them. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bruchek. Greetings. Thank you for welcoming me here, and thank you for doing such 
a detailed land acknowledgement. Land acknowledgements are becoming far more common these days, but they are not always so conscious of colonial settler intrusions, nor are they situated on land that was so obviously dispossessed to create a university. So tonight, what I'd like to share with you is some insights from some of the work on the Wampum Trail and some of the other work that I do in multiple museums and collections. And the question I ask is, how do indigenous objects in museum collections speak to those who collect, curate, observe, and claim them? Each of these objects obviously reflects particular ecosystems, eras, cultures, and technologies, but they also retain memories of the artisans who created them. And when we retrace the paths of these memories and these moments of creation to these objects, I like to think that these objects are often reawakened. Despite having been cataloged as inert and inanimate, object beings can and do communicate, but they are not always clearly seen and heard. They can wield not just imagined meanings or distributed agency, but literal power as conveyors of messages, participants in diplomacy, and other than human beings. And yet in museums, these aspects and these agencies are often obscured, not just by simplistic labels, but also by Eurocentric theories that tend to limit conceptions of agency and animacy, and by museum exhibits that lock them away in glass cases, not of their own making. So tonight I'll offer some reflections upon the curatorial histories of some of the objects that I am working with that, despite decades of silence in collections, are waking up. In some cases, seemingly unknown histories can be recovered by tracking the desires and actions of the collectors who transported these objects. In all cases, these objects can be better understood by considering indigenous conceptions of animacy and relationship. Now the term animacy, in this sense, embraces the nuances of belief systems and lived relationships among humans who engage with other than humans, animals, ancestral spirits, natural forces, etc., and objects past and present. If seemingly inanimate objects have the possibility of being or becoming animate, they can be a source of potential engagement, potential power, and potential danger. For better or worse, they are also potential relatives. One simply must learn and know, at the very least, how to recognize them, if not how to speak with them. Now, the work that I do has developed into what I call restorative methodologies. Restorative methodologies may seem to be rather straightforward, revisiting old scholarship and reconsidering research, but I like to track the paths that objects have followed through what I call object cartography. I always go back and double check and triple check where foundational knowledge has come from because I find that many times in archives and museums, knowledges about objects are rooted in some speculation that became part of a catalog card, that became part of an exhibit label, that became part of a tradition in a department that became, for better or worse, fact. And many of these facts are founded on very speculative details. So by following these particular details with all objects, I track back to try to figure out what they truly are. So for instance, when I come into museums, I have a particular method in speaking with and sitting with and photographing and analyzing objects, and I am always surrounded by curators who want to tell me what they know. And I am often saying, wait, let me speak with the object first. So for example, in the Denver Art Museum, I was told that the small wampum object in the front was an Apache wampum collar that had been made by Apache prisoners from beads that they had collected through trade with New England natives. None of those details is true other than the fact that those are in fact New England wampum beads. That is actually a Penobscot wampum collar, but the strange attribution of Apache came through some kind of misspelling and mishearing of some other record, and it stuck over time. So a lot of the work I do is trying to peel away those old understandings. Now, when I go into archives, it helps enormously to understand that archives are social places. And archives are constructed not just of material records of documents, but of social relations among the people who collect documents, who catalog them, and who determine how to put them into a particular form. So for instance, here in the Canadian Museum of History, my research assistant, Lise Puyo, who is a French speaker, is speaking with Benoit Tario who is, is French, French-Canadian, and although I speak French, I find it easier sometimes and more interesting to put people who are of common language families together and then listen to them talk. 
my favorite anecdote is when Lise came into me, came with me into an, a museum where the archivist only spoke French, and I overheard her saying to Lise in beautiful French, your professor, she is looking at these objects as though they might be alive and could speak to her. Does she believe in this? And Lise said, it is not my place to speculate about my professor's beliefs, but she is indigenous, and so perhaps this is the case. Very uh, diplomatic. Because you see, my research assistants learn when they come with me that what we are also doing is tracking the relations that have developed around these objects. Because in every institution, whether it is wampum, whether it is some other item of cultural heritage, whether it is some beautiful piece of, of construction, these objects take on meanings far beyond what was intended in their indigenous context. In this particular case, I can tell you for a fact that these two wampum belts once lived at the village of Ganesatage, that they were purchased by Frank Speck from a Frenchman who was an antiquities dealer, that they were then sold through multiple hands, they were then hidden and transported across the border, and then Frank Speck sold two of them to what was then the Victoria Museum to fund his research in other tribal nations. And although this information was very well documented, it was not widely known even to the museum that curated these objects until the research commenced. And so even at the Penn Museum, I specialize in bringing students into the classroom to determine how to bring out these hidden histories in these particular objects. So for example, in the Algonquin language, a basket is sometimes identified as a numundu, a container of mystery that holds, that literally wraps its woven body around something that may or not, may not be animate, but knowing what is within would change our understanding of the basket itself and of the contents therein. And so it is that Frank Speck collected Anne Caesar's sewing basket, which might seem to be utilitarian, and it lived in collections mute until I opened it up one day, a hundred years after it was collected, and pulled out the note that Speck had carefully tucked inside, where he noted that for Anne, this was more than a utilitarian basket. The external design included maple leaves, a sacred tree that gives it sap and sugar, and the basket had more than a simple purpose. A perhaps more evocative object in the Penn Museum collections is this Kaskaskian beaver bowl. It was long cataloged by the museum as a simplistic carving, an early example of a tourist object. A tourist object that came from 1795, which seems rather odd, given that there are no tourists collecting in 1795, but research, in fact, revealed that this bowl was both a participant and a witness to the Treaty of Greenville. It came into Judge Turner's hands in company with a pipestone pipe bowl and three pipe stems. With this knowledge in hand, we know that the brass eyes of this bowl witnessed the speeches and negotiations. Its mouth held the spoon and its body held the beaver tail stew that was eaten to feed the allies and the alliance. And that changes our understanding of this seemingly mute object's purpose. And so in a world where objects can be, can be construed as kin, where power can be invested in these material beings, seemingly disparate forms can be woven together into assemblages that may eloquently symbolize and materialize and remember intertribal, intercultural, or transnational understandings. This historical object being, which you see in an old black and white photo, is called the dish belt. It rested in the collections of the Royal Ontario Museum for several centuries, before finally being repatriated to Six Nations at Grand River. Materially, this belt encodes the dish with one spoon concept, where allies would literally or conceptually be fed beaver tail stew. And that concept is evoked in the purple center composed of purple quahog beads that evoke the dish, the white beads in the center that indicate the food that will feed all, all the people gathered, and the field of the belt is composed of white whelk beads indicating that all of that territory is a peaceful and communal place where all can travel safely. To give you a little more detail to sort of break down the ontology of this, the purple dish, the white beads, and it communicates an intertribal agreement to co-curate and co-inhabit a shared territory. John Sconawanti Buck, who was the last holder of it before a collector snagged it and sold it to the museum, noted, quote, it says they have entered into one great league and contract that they will all be one and have one heart. The spot in the center is a dish of beaver indicating that they will have one dish and what belongs to one will belong to all. And we are in a territory where if you do not know the dish with one spoon agreement, 
I certainly hope you do come to understand it because it still exists to the present day, particularly among the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. So I also make a point of sort of reminding people that these object insights are not as distant as they might seem, and they are not as mysterious as they could be. But they are recoverable if we are asking the right questions, if we are speaking with the correct individuals who may know this knowledge, and even if we are considering how these things came together. So who made these objects? What were the knowledges that are evidenced? How were the objects handled? And I like to especially emphasize how has the museum's knowledge of this object been constructed? Because if I have not made this point clearly enough, much of what we claim to know is what was known by the most prestigious individual who was not native who had their hands on this object. So, more particularly regarding wampum. The Wampum Trail project that I direct came into being literally at the request of the Haudenosaunee Standing Committee and other tribal nations who were puzzled by this desire of museums to hold on to wampum belts and by this need for indigenous communities to bring them home. Wampum beads as a category of knowledge and a category of being are composed of beads that are taken from the white center part of the whelk purple from the oldest quahog shells. They are constructed into patterns and images that convey various messages and meanings. So in general, as I've noted, white signals ease, harmony, peace, agreement, alliance. Purple signals complexity, difficulty, and sometimes danger, but it can also signal a concentration of power and resources. And in many cases, wampum belts are actually made up of the components of older belts that were taken apart to weave into these objects. So you can see in this particular image that this belt has beads that are not uniform and the, the roughness of the weft and the warp on which they are woven tells you that they were assembled together to make this particular object. Now, when I come into collections, I find that the meanings in these objects, as I've noted already, are obscured by the way things are sorted, but they're also obscured by the fact that these significant objects that are meant to speak and communicate have long been separated from the communities who made them. So in the absence of consultation, wampum belts and other significant objects are typically cataloged by type, by collector, by geographical region, or by cultural area. And some categories like relic and art and tool and tourist object further distance objects from the makers who created them. And then when they're displayed in museums, they become objects of wonder and awe. And in this case, I asked two dear friends of mine to look at this display at the National Museum of the American Indian and tell me your first reaction. And this was it, awe. But that sense of awe actually pushes objects farther away because it makes them something of mystery as though they are somehow unknowable when in fact there is a great deal to know and say. And these wampum belts that were made to speak so clearly are rendered objects of mute fascination. Now I found that museums and audiences have actually trained each other to indulge in what I call material and myopia. So they see objects through distorted lenses that conceal more than they reveal. When I first arrived at the University of Pennsylvania, I would, they, they told me with great excitement that they had wampum belts in their collections and that they knew virtually nothing about them, which of course made me very eager to see them and speak with them. And I was told that they had been there for more than a century and were inherently unidentifiable. So one came in the early 1900s, and one was a little newer, came in 1920. The top one is a collar. It's a Penobscot collar. If you haven't learned that yet, it's very similar to the one that lives at the Denver Museum in terms of its construction. But the two wampum belts are particularly interesting, and I'll call your attention to the one on the bottom, which is a classic path belt. A path belt, by definition, is made with a white background and two enclosed figures at the ends, in this case, squares. The path between indicates a safe place to travel, and depending on the colorage of the belt, it can indicate a fraught territory with a safe path or a safe territory with a dark path. This you can see is a safe territory dark path. The path goes to these two locations, and then it continues on at either end. And this is discernible with basic wampum semiotics without even knowing the provenance of the belt. But I specialize in provenance research, and in this case, when I found that the belt had this association with Alfred Barnes, another one had this association with Walter Wyman, I tracked those two collectors. I found a few more names, 
And then I started tracking those names. And one of the names happened to be Reverend Elkanah Holmes, who was a missionary at Buffalo Creek in the uh, early 1800s. So I thought, well, let's look at the missionary records. And it may have been luck, it may have been stubbornness and determination, but within a few weeks of searching after the belts had been mute for more than a century, I was able to find the document that identified the belt very specifically. And it said, we are given to understand that the belt mentioned above is more than two feet in length, which in fact is true, three inches in breadth, Eight rows of pure wampum, two of which are purple, signifying a plain, wide path. The other six rows, denoting the six nations of Indians, are white. So you can count the three on either side. Three rows on either path, implying safety and liberty for each party to pass and repass to visit each other. Now here's an anomaly. That document, which was written in 1794, goes on to say, that the squares signify the Mahikaduk Nation of Indians and the New York Baptist Association united in love and friendship. I don't know if you know your geography, but the Mohican Indians, Stockbridge Mohican Indians, were living in Stockbridge, Massachusetts at that time. And the path from Stockbridge to New York City is north and south, and it does not pass through any of the Six Nations. It kind of skirts Mohawk territory. But the Stockbridge had removed shortly before to Oneida territory, where indeed to travel, they had to go from Stockbridge east and west, which went right through New York State into Ontario across Haudenosaunee territory. So I was able to document that this is a belt that the Haudenosaunee gave the Mohican, and the Mohican then gave to this minister claiming it represented this new relationship. And part of how I also broke this down was by calling on many of the people I work with. So for instance, Peter Jemison, who is a Seneca faith keeper, to come in and talk around this belt and talk over this belt and think it through. And so sometimes documents and objects actually live side by side in the same archives, if not the same museum, and they are overlooked because there's an assumption that they're simply not known. So how do we address this kind of confusion? What I find is that visibility is key. Tactile engagement is key. Objects and words and knowledges are visible only if they can be seen, by which I mean sensed and recognized as living beings or as iterations of other words, objects, categories, communities, relationships that are otherwise known. So this example, for instance, is a zigzag wampum belt that lives at the British Museum, and it's long been an object of fascination, and I am in the midst of a very deep dive into its history. And just to give you a little hint, I believe it is Lenape, and there's a story behind that. So without going too long into the evening, I do have more to share with you, but this is just a brief list of where the Wampum Trail Project has taken me. And what I find very interesting is that in many cases, I find that objects in one collection can be documented by archives in another, and communities in yet another place. And so I've reached the point after years of doing this that I truly believe these wampum belts are directing my steps in many locations. So I am drawn to find missing objects in many cases, and people call me and happen to have things I'm looking for. So it does not mean that I am a unique researcher. It merely means that these objects are lonely. They've long been looking for the communities they're connected to. I was drawn to this work by my dear friend Rick Hill, who was at one point the chair of the Haudenosaunee Standing Committee and who has worked for a very long time with Haudenosaunee repatriation issues. My research assistant, Stephanie Mock, is Navajo, works with me very closely. And what I find is that the relationships I'm developing with tribal communities also become part of this research. But today I'm here to talk about the object relations. So for example, let me fill you in on some details of wampum that have always been known to the makers, have always been known to the objects, but are only recently becoming known to curators. This is the two dog wampum belt. It lives at the McCord Museum. It was made by the Ganesatage Mohawk at what we call uh, Lake of Two Mountains or Ganesatage. It was made to record and preserve their understanding with the Sulpicians that the Sulpicians would be allowed to build a church there as long as the church was rooted in the land and as long as the native community and the Sulpicians held up the church together. And so you can see that quite literally in the belt where the cross breaks the land and where the figures on either side are holding up the cross. The figures in the center happen to be Sulpicians. You'll note they are big and empty, so they have no heart. They don't have full bodies. 
but the native figures on the belt have full bodies, and at either end, they are guarding the territory with wolves who are acting as dogs. It is called two dogs because the two wolves are behaving like dogs and being ready to call awareness and call attention to any dangers. Also notice the figures at the ends, their heads are turned to the side, literally looking outwards. And if you look at the beads under the dog's feet, you'll see the dogs are slightly, the wolves as dogs are slightly rising off the ground. This particular belt was made at a time when the Ganawage Mohawk and Ganastage Mohawk and Akwasasne and Odenak and Wendake were part of an alliance called the Seven Nations, so Catholicized native people along the St. Lawrence. And so the belt records that there are seven nations involved. Those seven nations are the bands on the ends of the belt. So if you count those short bands, you'll see six, and then the bottom band is Gnosotake. This belt also shows dense evidence of repair and rework, including the fact that the leather warp strands of the belt are repurposed from an older object. You can see how they're colored with ochre, and at the ends, you can't see it quite as clearly here, but they show distinct pinch marks from having been woven into some other iteration. And as I mentioned early on, many of the belts that live today contain parts of older belts within them. And you can see multiple moments of repair and many different kinds of beads. And then some of the beads you can see have traces of rust. Some have traces of red ochre. And they, there are also beads that are made of anomalous components. Let me explain. The material insights that come from wampum indicate some of these basic things. I'll come back to those anomalous beads in a moment. So in general, wampum is a binary system, white whelk, purple quahog, young whelk, old quahog. Fresh shell is easier to make than dry shell, which could explain why the technology was lost for a while. People were working with dried shells, and they also did not have access to abundant marine resources. The waters have to be very clean and have to be a perfect mix of fresh and salt water. And these distinctive weaving patterns and uses of anomalous beads are indicative of how these belts are made, and they're quite visible. So whelk and quahog. Here are a few of the weaving patterns. This is from a report that I developed that summarizes some of these details. You see a cross at the top. You see a cross and twist. And at the bottom, you're looking at an old belt that was woven with sinew. The sinew started to break away and then it was repaired by weaving hemp in amongst the sinew. So often belts show signs of indigenous repair. But I love calling people's attention to these anomalous beads. Do you see the blue glass bead? Is it visible? Does everyone see it? Third row from the top, at the end of that white row. Once you see these, you can't not see them, and I have yet to find curators that have noticed them before I get there and they are obviously placed. These are not accidental inclusions. You do not accidentally mistake glass for shell. You choose it very selectively. Do you see the steatite bead in this belt? Down at the bottom, it's made of stone. So these anomalous beads have messages in and of themselves. I like to say there are no mistakes in wampum. Things are woven in for a particular purpose, if there is an offset pattern or an extra bead. And then there are belts that have been damaged over time, not through destruction, but through accidents of handling or breakage or extensive wear, and the damage changes the message. So for instance, this is an old French alliance belt that lives at the Canadian Museum of History, and the French alliance was set up so that the native people were making an alliance, it was Huron Wendat in this case, making an alliance with the French, and the deal was this. We both have weapons but we shall agree not to use them against each other. Here are our axes, we are putting them down. Because to have a weapon and ground it is much more powerful than to have no weapons at all. And we will hold a covenant chain between us. And you can see the figures holding the chain, and that will keep us connected. But the belt was worn and broken over time, and then someone altered it. Before it came to the museum, it was altered, so one end was cut. Can you see the cut strands on the far right? And that cut end took the weapon out. So suddenly, one figure is neutered. It's a very different message. They no longer have the power to affect each other. But here's the really interesting thing. This belt is much adored by Native communities to the degree that multiple reproductions of it have been made, but all the reproductions are missing the weapons. So at the Canadian Museum, there are two reproductions, one in plastic beads at the top, one in glass beads in the middle, against the original at the bottom, 
and it's a very different message. So I'm finding that there's a tradition that has emerged in the 20th century and now into the 21st century of quote unquote reproducing wampum belts, but I have yet to see a reproduction that actually matches the original for several reasons. One is that there is a creative intervention, in this case, that changes the message. Another is that the beads are very different. And another is that the beads that are used today are generally larger. So if you look at a reproduction of a belt, you'll see something that is massive rather than its original size, which changes the way people start to think about wampum. Now, another example of a category of belts that still survives in collections are belts associated with Lenape and William Penn. I've been tracking these for quite some time now. And to give you a sense of how durable the understandings are in these belts, these belts associated with Penn are very, very distinctive in the way they're made and also in the images that are used. And each of them bears evidence of similar patterns of bead choice and construction. So one lived at the Philadelphia History Museum until quite recently. It's now at Drexel College. And we're working on figuring out how to make it more visible and bring it back. But in this case, it indicates the Lenape extending the hand of friendship to William Penn as they live in this land amidst three rivers, the Schuylkill, the Susquehannock, and the Delaware. And there has been debate over time about which is the larger figure. Is William Penn the big guy with the hat? Or is he the little guy with no hat? And if you look at the records, the Lenape say, when you were small and helpless, we took your hand and we fed you. And so I do believe the Lenape chief is the big guy. Then there are two more belts associated with William Penn that live at the National Museum of the American Indian. And then there's another one that was repatriated to Six Nations at Grand River, Ontario. Now, these also match up to a 1712 document that recently surfaced at the American Philosophical Society that depicts the symbols on these belts, or ones very like them, in the hands of a Lenape delegation to the Five Nations, suggesting there may actually have been duplicates of these belts in circulation, such that one was sent to England with Penn and one remained here among the Lenape. And then there's this belt. So at the top, you see the one of the first pen belts. At the bottom, you see something that I was told was a pen belt. This one lives in the Royal Ontario Museum. And there was a repatriation claim on it when I was asked to look at it. And the minute I saw it, I had to restrain myself from laughing. Because quite honestly, the construction looks like drunken macrame. This belt was actually correct, collected by Ronya Teka from a man named John Wampum, alias Chief Wabano, who was a Muncie minister and cultural performer who made multiple trips to England. And here is John Wampum with a headdress. He spoke on temperance, and he attempted to convince the queen that he was a direct descendant of Chief Tammany, and thereby he was the sole inheritor of Lenape lands in Pennsylvania. He was also one of the tribal leaders invited to the 1882 commemoration and there's the program in Philadelphia, where the belt that had recently come back from the Penn family was on prominent display. And you can see it illustrated on the program. And so what I believe happened is he saw this belt and got an idea. And here's what he created. He took wampum beads, so the beads are genuine, but he took wampum beads from multiple sources, perhaps even cannibalizing other belts to do this. Some of the beads he used are massive. They are two to three times a normal wampum bead. Some of them are quite small and broken. They don't match up in any particular way. And then he wove them with carpet twine. That's part of how we can date the weaving to around 1860. And he had never really studied how wampum is made. He created these horizontal rows top and bottom. And then as you may have noticed in the earlier image, he sewed rabbit fur onto it for reasons I do not understand. So it is not a legitimate wampum belt, but it is legitimate wampum beads. So what does a museum do with an object like that? Well, my advice is actually to just hang on to it. And I am actually working on a publication about it. So as I noted a little earlier, when I showed you that zigzag wampum belt, there's one more belt that I believe is Lenape, and I think it is this zigzag one. And the reason is because of the construction. So the shape and style of beads, the shape and style of weaving, the way the belt is configured, and the fact that it, too, is pictured in that 1712 document that lists 34 Lenape wampum belts. And in that document, it notes that it means, at the top, that when they arrive, they would fully hear and understand them, and that they may have liberty to pass and repass in all places.
That's a different kind of path built. In this case, it's a path that meanders, but you'll notice it's open. You can follow it inside of those pieces and go out either end and continue on. But another quote I'd like to draw your attention to, or draw your attention to, is one that comes from Jean-André Kwok, who was a missionary at Ganesatage. And he interpreted the Ganeankahaka word for wampum, kahione, to mean a literal and figurative river of woven words, which is a wonderful bit of poetry. Because of its elongated configuration and because of the wampum beads of which it is composed, it represents the flows and the waves. And just as a navigable waterway facilitates the mutual meeting of nations, so the kahione, the constructed river, is a sign of covenant, concord, and friendship. It serves to rally the divided minds among them. It is the featured union of hearts. So a river and a wampum belt share a common purpose. They represent and embody a navigable path that diverse parties can follow to speak with one another despite their differences. Now, as just one of many belts that evoke this concept, I draw your attention to this Huron wampum belt that lives in Chard Cathedral, where it was sent in the 1680s. It contains both wampum shell beads and glass beads. It was made at Wendake specifically to speak to the Virgin Mary. So not to the Jesuits who carried it, not to the priests who curated it, but to the Virgin herself. And interestingly enough, when I first saw this belt, I was told the glass beads were repairs made in the religious order at Chart, in the, in the ethnographic museum at Chart, and that the repairs had to be obviously different so one could denote the originals. And so I sent my French research assistant, Lise Puyot, to France to look at it, and she confirmed that the beads are in the original weave and they only appear in the Latin words. They do not appear in the background of the belt. They do not appear in the word Huronia, which represents Huron territory. But they do appear in these Latin figures. So there's a great deal of interest going on there, and we believe that these may once have been rosary beads. So think about that. You weave together religious beads from one context with religious beads from another context to signal not only an embrace of the Catholic religion, but a new alliance so the Virgin Mary can protect you if necessary against these Jesuits who claim to speak for her. Now there is also the question of the afterlife of wampum belts and beads. What happens when a belt breaks? What happens when an agreement shifts, when objects are taken apart, when an alliance fractures? During my surveys in museum collections, I encountered a unique category of objects, wooden clubs and wooden bowls embedded with wampum beads that, due to the obvious evidence of drilled holes and traces of weft, had obviously been removed from a woven object, most likely a belt, and then repurposed as apparent ornamentation on a wooden object. The placement of these beads inside a bowl, along the spine of a club, or as you see here, inside a feasting bowl, clearly signals more than merely decorative purposes. When objects like these are seen and recognized, they speak to us in very emotional and very interesting ways. And I would argue that people who are no longer present can speak to us through these objects. So look here, for example, this is clearly a bowl, perhaps utilitarian, wooden, round, functional. Maybe it held cornmeal, mush, or succotash, most likely 17th, 18th century, Northeastern native, but when you look closely and see the signs of wear and repair, and when you look closely at the wampum beads embedded in it, then it's easy to understand how the Mohegans see this bowl. Because they see this as a significant object, literally a container for peace. And I should note, by the way, that Mohegan territory in Fort Shantock is one of the densest locales for wampum production, literally harvesting the shells at the water's edge and making them for diplomatic purposes. And so when those beads are put into this bowl, it changes the use. It makes this object more than just a utilitarian piece. And it makes it something that is of great significance to that tribal nation. And then there are the wooden clubs, which I'm currently fascinated with and tracking around the world. I know of at least seven wooden clubs with wampum inclusions. Each has its own distinctive story. One, a Wampanoag example dubbed King Philip's Club, lives at the Fruitlands Museum, and there were beads embedded all along the spine as well as along the sides of this club. Another wampum cl club with, more, with less wampum and more weight resides in the Horniman Museum in England, 
And in this particular case, wampum is included in the teeth and nostrils of the underwater panther that is at the handle end of this particular club. Then there is a Mohawk club that lives at the Bibliothèque saint jean vieve and another example lives at the Musée de Cabralny. Now, in instances where objects like this were obviously transformed, the message changes, but I would suggest the component parts might remember part of their original purpose. So picture, for example, a wampum belt woven of purple and white shell beads, meticulously gathered from the liminal waters at ocean's edge, carefully crafted to record a crucial intercultural agreement. But during a fraught moment, the making, reading, and sharing of that agreement broke. And when that happened, things changed, and the belt was broken into pieces, and the beads were torn out and then glued into carved notches that nestled along the backbone and face of a now menacing war club spotted with blood. The object is far from silent. We were once allies, the white beads cry. We promised you protection, the purple beads insist. But now, your duplicity has forced us back into the thorny bushes where our minds have turned to war. And that is what all of these clubs, unfortunately, seem to be saying. So differing understandings of these levels of animacy do not just constitute differing belief systems. They influence our relationships with objects and with communities, our relationships with selves and others, and they can illuminate or obscure the past. And then there are these lovely little moments of discovery where objects reappear in very unexpected places. In tracking the collections of the Royal Ontario Museum, I came across, rather by accident, an assemblage of wampum beads that had been collected by Frank Speck. And in that case, I realized that Frank Speck was on a sort of wampum trail of his own. He was collecting samples of beads from multiple locations to try to figure out who was using what kind of wampum for what. And quite poetically, I realized that he was also collecting a very rare sample of early disc wampum. In this case, a purple bead, a single purple bead, a single white bead from Pequot Mohegan territory, where the Mohegan and Pequot have once been one nation and had split and remembered that split, and they are split even today. But those beads have survived in this little collection, waiting to go home. And so in closing, what I'd like to share with you is some examples of what I call restorative research and how this kind of work can change our relations with one another in museum collections. Because I have found that despite the advent of the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, and even the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada, it is still extraordinarily difficult for Native nations to reclaim patrimonial and sacred objects. And it is still difficult to come to consensus about who owns what. Federal laws, I suggest, simply provoke categorical questions over who has authority, and a lot of time is spent or perhaps wasted mediating disputes rather than building new relationships. Because what I've found is that restorative approaches, approaches actually bring tribal nations and museums closer to reconciliation, which is a really wonderful goal. I find that thoughtful discourse could circle around and bring to light indigenous beliefs, object personhood, ancestral relationships, ontologies, and could also help us grapple with this continuing legacy of colonial settler relations. So if we re-examine these idiosyncratic practices of collecting, if we reinvestigate these museum narratives, we can change the conversation and we can help objects and communities to speak for themselves. So for example, to demonstrate how dramatic these shifts can be, Take the case of the Mohegan Nation. It took more than a century for Yale Peabody Museum to acknowledge the possibility that Lucy Occam Tanaquidgeon's bowl with wampum beads might be more than a mere utilitarian object. And they argued at considerable length around the fact that it did not fit a NAGPRA category. But in 2018, when they finally reached a resolution to bring it home, it brought with it more than 2,000 other objects, including the entire archeological collection from Fort Shantock, a key wampum producing site. And all of that material now lives with the Mohegan Nation again. In another case that, has been, that I've been very intimately involved with for more, nearly a decade now, two wampum belts that were constructed at Onondaga in the early 1700s were sent to Gnesetage to remind them that they were still part of the Confederacy. 
They left Genesatagi in 1915, along with the two you saw at the Canadian Museum when they were sold to Frank Speck. They traveled through the hands of multiple collectors. One remained in the collections at the National Museum of the American Indian, and the other showed up for auction at Sotheby's, where it was advertised as a rare and early Eastern Woodlands wampum belt, and Sotheby's experts swore to me there was nothing more to be known. But in fact, there was a great deal more to be known. It took seven years, diplomacy with the museum, with the private collector, and private collectors are out of the reach of NAGPRA, but finally, after extensive research, we got the belts back to Gnesetage. And I'd like to call your attention to this way of thinking about objects, because when I staged this photograph, here is Speck's photograph in 1915. Here are the two belts reunited in 2018, and miraculously, they were very well curated through all of those travels. And moments after taking the photograph on the right, we carried the belts outside and put them into the hands of the wampum keepers. So Chief Nelson and Dean Ottawa, who is from Kitigan Zabi. And the transformation in these objects, the same objects from inert to living, is really quite remarkable. Because that's what these objects were meant to do. They were not meant to be trapped in glass cases. They were meant to live. They were meant to breathe. They were meant to come out into the air and to circulate among communities and to be handled. And even in cases where objects are lost forever, memories can be recovered. I've been working with the Wampanoag who have been searching, desperately searching, for King Philip's wampum belt, which in 1676, at the end of King Philip's war, the Wampanoag chief Medicom, King Philip, his belt was taken by Captain Benjamin Church and sent to England. Despite decades of searching, it appears to be lost forever. But that loss inspired Wampanoag artisans to collaborate with the British Museum, Pitt Rivers Museum, and Arts Council England to craft a new belt with beads, leather, and every stitch processed by Wampanoag hands. And they are finishing the construction of that belt as we speak. And so in closing, this is my point. The process of recovering object meanings requires not just research rigor and ethical attention, but consultation, collaboration, kinship, and new relationships. For just as the Haudenosaunee utilize rituals of condolence to guide grieving or conflicted parties out of conflict and toward clear-mindedness, we can introduce collaborative models of research and repatriation to improve museum relations with the indigenous. Because no matter what they have been through, these objects are still part of our shared history. They may appear as strangers, but they are somebody's kin. Even if you think they are dead, they may yet be alive. Thank you. And I have time for questions. Yes. Who would like the cube or the microphone? I'm not. Yeah. Yeah, I've not seen it yet. Ah. Oh, I can. That's, that's actually an interesting question because until rather recently, so the question is about gender and wampum belts, and until rather recently there was a widespread perception that they were uh, objects made and circulated by men. But in fact, in oral traditions, in the colonial records, there are numerous examples of women not only weaving the belts, but also making beads. And so in indigenous communities, technology is not gender directed. Technology is sorted by who has access to what materials. So for instance, in the Fort Shantok collection of Mohegan wampum, what I have found is that all of these activities are happening simultaneously. So whelk and quahog are being harvested to eat by both men and women doing the harvesting. Then they are being broken up to make beads by both men and women. And then we don't know the gender of the people who are doing the drilling, but we know it's happening at the same time because the shells are quite fresh and all of the materials are preserved in the archeological record. But also the debris from wampum making is ending up as temper in the pottery. So perhaps at Fort Shantok, men are making beads and women are making pots, 
but that's not perhaps the most important thing. So I, what I believe from what I know of these objects is that the making has to be collaborative. So a single individual does not weave a belt from beginning to end, but it is collectively done by many hands over time. And in many cases, wampum keepers were also wampum repairers. So I think the emphasis on tribal chiefs in the 19th century and early 20th century may have pushed us away from really understanding how wampum was being used. So just to give one more example, in the 1600s, the person who wore perhaps the most recorded wampum of all was Wiedemo, who was a Sunksqua, which is a female chief among the Wampanoag. And so she was well recorded as making and wearing vast quantities of wampum. So the gender, I guess, is not a fixed answer, but it's depending on the locale and the community. Yeah. Other? Yeah. You gonna try throwing it? <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna toss it to Ricky. Okay. You ready? Thank you. Get yeah, so. Oh, there you go. Great, yeah, uh, thank you for uh, a very fascinating talk. I learned so much. Um, so um, I've always uh, held this belief that the role of scholars um, in all of this is not necessarily to widen the gulf between communities and institutions or to create tensions or to basically create a wedge. Uh, but to, you know, uh, that's why I really like and embrace your idea of restorative uh, methodologies and uh, uh, finding ways to um, collaborate mm -hmm. and uh, of create mechanisms for doing so. Um, but my, my question is that, you know, um, you know the, the initiation of these kinds of collaborative relationships, um, uh, from what uh, angle or perspective and what should motivate these kinds of, of work? You are in a particularly uh, well-situated um, context where I do think, and I'm convinced that you, you could do it, but many uh, institutions uh, cannot seem to do so, nor would know how to um, you know, do the first initiate the first step. So I'm, I'm interested in uh, hearing some examples of how that could be done. That's one reason that I've started to really theorize about methods and write about methods. And in fact, I'm working on a new publication with Kara Krampodich at the University of Toronto that will be called Research as Alliance, where what we hope to do is collect many, many examples, because there are so many people doing this right now, especially in Canada, where Scholars, whether they be native or non-native, are collaborating with knowledge bearers and communities and native communities and collaborating with institutions to figure out how do we do this? Because what I think has gotten in the way is the, the hierarchy of status and knowledge. <clears throat> and quite honestly, I could not have done this work from the ground up. I had to reach a position of status in an institution in order to do this work. So I'm fully aware of the fact that I carry with me the privilege of being a University of Pennsylvania professor, but I also carry with me being indigenous and being committed to indigenous communities. So often I am trying to figure out way to bring, ways to bring indigenous knowledge bearers up and into the conversation. So that's why I think how we construct knowledge and power has to change. And it's why I am often a critic of pro programs like NAGPRA, which were necessary, absolutely necessary, but NAGPRA often devolves into arguments over who owns what and whether something fits a category rather than conversations around who deserves and needs to be in communication with these collections. So I think there are, there are many strategies and many approaches. And I actually take heart in what the Royal Ontario Museum is doing as we speak, because Canada does not have a federal law that governs this. Truth and reconciliation is not a law, it's an ideal. And it's often an ideal recognized in the breach more than the practice. But what ROM is doing is they're starting to reach out to communities saying, we have your stuff and we need you to come in and talk with us about what's the best thing to do with it. Should it go home with you? Should it stay here? You know, how do we work that out? And so it's hard for people in positions of power to give up power. And, but, it's, but I like to say it's easy to open the doors and invite people in to talk with you. So I think that's what will start to change things more than anything else. The more people can talk with one another. Yeah, that's my thought. Oh. Hi. Um, 
I was really intrigued by the example you gave of the belt with the rabbit fur. Um, and I, I think I was most intrigued by your last comment was that you would recommend that the museum hold on to it. And I guess um, I would like you to expand on that, especially because you were there for a repatriation claim, if I understood that correctly. So did you inform that decision or that recommendation based on the fact that you don't consider the work to be authentic? Or was there another reasoning for um, uh, consulting the museum to hold on to that piece? So it's, it's not authentic. It's not Lenape, that's absolutely certain. There is no way to affiliate it with a particular tribal nation. And even the fact that it was made by this fellow who went by multiple names, Scobie Logan, John Wampum, Chief Wabano, depending on the decade, we don't know where he got the beads from. And so I am not an advocate of repatri repatriating objects to communities that do not belong to those objects, or of repatriating objects simply to get them out of the museum. And I think it actually becomes an illustrative case of a really bad copy that is not even a copy. And if I didn't say this already, one of the problems with this belt in particular, because wampum is a binary system, dark and light, you'll note that John Wampum did not have enough white beads. And so he used light purple beads for the figures, which actually sends a signal that these figures are descending into darkness which is a really bad message in wampum. So when the message is altered, it changes the object. So it's a case where it's not an object that would be at home or would be good for any community to house. But in the museum, it's an illustrative case of even indigenous people can make mistakes or make bad choices about objects. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been really interesting. I am, I, I'm going to ask a rather bizarre question, um, and you can just tell me it's bizarre. Um, the, uh, you have images of rivers running through your presentation, ah. often in the be behind the words. And um, wampum carries messages, of course, and uh, is also closely related to rivers, as you've mm -hmm. suggested. So I'm just asking you, um, is your talk a wampum belt? And um, is it uh, helping us with relations? You caught it, yeah. You caught the surreptitious message that underlies all of it. The river you're looking at is the Connecticut River. And the Quinnetacook River, it's where, where I live when I am not in Philadelphia, where my home is. and. It's one of the rivers that was really key to the wampum trade because wampum being made on the coast, the southern coast of what we call New England, was being transported up this river and into the northern territories and then across other rivers to Haudenosaunee territories. And in fact, the Haudenosaunee or the Six Nations Iroquois, who are masters of wampum diplomacy and semiotics, were not the makers of the beads themselves. The beads came from these coastal contexts. And so, yes, I like to think when I do a talk with these particular images on this topic, that it is asking you to walk with me and to travel with me and to paddle with me along those ways and think about how these are all connected. And it's part of the research that I do because I often find that, you know, as I note, things are not just in disparate locations, but it requires travel to really come to these understandings. There is something different that happens when I am sitting with um, tribal knowledge keepers at Wendake, or when I am going to Kitigan Zabi, or when I am going to Mohegan and sitting with these people, things change the way we think about the landscape and we think about objects. So yes, indeed. Other questions? Thank you. Um, I guess um, I guess my question is more about um, like wampum as a form of writing. Mm -hmm. um, so like you talk a lot about like the narratives they can like you can decipher, and you talk about like semiotics, for example. I'm just wondering like if you can just like talk more about like uh, wampum as a form of like indigenous writing and um, literacy. So the best way to answer that is that wampum is not a linear narrative per se, but it is a system of symbols, 
and combinations that come to have particular meanings. And so uh, I, we're actually just talking about this today over lunch, that wampum is not like a narrative that starts in one place and runs to the next place, or even like a fixed message that is always absolutely the same in time. And it is not that each beat is a word or each pattern is a phrase. It doesn't, it doesn't map onto, liter onto spoken literacy as we know it. It maps onto lived diplomacy. It maps onto lived relationships. So it encodes and maps how people are expected to interact with one another in a shared or in a separate territory. So there are belts, for example, that are intended to show distinct and separate nations that might be in the same field but do not have a connection to one another. And it's interesting, when I call to mind that first William Penn belt, I was actually just given a wampum belt, interestingly enough, by one of my senior colleagues at Penn when I got tenure. And it surprised me that an old historical archaeologist, Robert Schuyler, would choose to give me a wampum belt. It was obviously a reproduction. But when I asked him what he chose, he did not choose this one. He chose the belt that preceded this one. Because this is a belt that was created once William Penn and the Lenape had come to an alliance and an agreement. But the belt that Bob gave me a copy of is one that shows two figures standing apart from one another. And in between them is a council house, but it's empty. And on either side of those figures are rivers. And one figure has a long area of white beads with two rivers. And one figure has a very small area of white beads with one river. And that belt is the precursor to this one. Because in that belt, Penn and the English settlers are in this little constricted space. And over here, Lenape people with all this territory. And if they choose to enter this council house and meet together, perhaps they can live together. But the way that belt is made, the council house goes all the way to the edge. You can't go around it. You can't go through it. You can only go into it. And once you go into it, if the other party enters, then you can do something. So that is probably the best example I can think of of how wampum maps and predicts and sometimes encodes these relationships. And unfortunately, in many museum collections, these knowledges have been distorted by speculative understandings that get mapped onto these belts. So part of what's become really wonderful about this project is pulling out these messages and memories that are still in there and are discernible in one way or another. Other questions? Thank you for your talk. It seems that with your re-examining these pieces that there would inevitably be changes to what the museum believes about the belt. Uh, have you, so what I'm getting at is, can you talk a little bit about some of the conflict, navigating the conflict that might arise from uh, reinterpretations or um, <clears throat> maybe where you have some ambiguity or uncertainty um, that, that remains. You've, you've told us some amazing stories, but I can imagine for every one of those, there's examples where you oh, yeah. couldn't find what you'd hoped. Exactly. I'll give you an example with this one. When the Wampanoag visited this belt last year, they desperately wanted it to be King Philip's wampum belt. They desperately wanted to enter a museum in England and find the lost belt they were looking for. And there's no evidence that it's associated with the Wampanoag. As I say, the material evidence suggests it's associated with Lenape. The provenance data is somewhat mysterious. It's a belt that you know people are sort of drawn to because it is so beautiful and it is in such beautiful condition. And it holds this object on the end that is an animal pouch but it has been fraught with so many misconceptions. So one retired curator years ago looked at that pouch and said, oh, that's a turtle. And so that idea that it was a turtle ended up in the catalog and the database and then got reproduced and printed and carried on to where native people were saying, yes, that is a turtle, and therefore it's a turtle clam belt, and you can see how things sort of go from there. But if you know anything about animal amulets and animal pouches, you would never want to have the pouch open at the butt end of the animal to put your medicine into. That's just, that's just wrong. It's always the mouth. And so the open end is the top. And then if you know anything about turtles, they don't have a spatular tail. 
And then when you look at this more closely, the tail actually is broken. So it was much longer. So the animal is a beaver. It's not a turtle. And then if you look at it very closely, the beads that are on that little figure are the old disc beads, very old disc beads. And one thing that was true in the colonial contact era is that wampum and beaver were key parts of this intercultural trade. So the beads, the figure, the construction, all of it map out to Lenape. And so there was actually a point when curators were saying, Marge, can you please explain this to the Wampanoag? And no, that's not my job. And so what has happened that really is so lovely, and it's just, it still strikes me as so amazing that this is how it's come to pass, is that the loss of King Philip's belt, the lack of the ability to identify it in any museum, directly led to creating a new belt. And so it was a case where by all of us collaborating together and talking together, the Wampanoag said, well, you know what? We're going to keep looking. But in the meantime, we're going to make the belt we believe we should have. And so when they started this, they actually got Wampanoag fisher, you know, fishermen and, and uh, people who work at the seashore to collect the living shells, to do bakes, to eat the, eat the, the mollusks, to carve the beads. They hunted deer on Martha's Vineyard to get the leather to make the warp. They gathered fiber to make the weft. And then they brought this around to all Wampanoag events over the course of about six months so anyone who was Wampanoag could weave on it. And so it is, by definition now, a Wampanoag belt. And it would never have existed if they had actually found the belt they were looking for, or if they had settled, or if they had argued over what they saw. So it's this beautiful example where sometimes a lost object can inspire something else altogether. So now they have, as a community, revitalized the wampum tradition that was theirs to begin with. So, yeah. Many things are possible. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was struck by the way in which you're interacting with colonial archives um, in your presentation, and I'm wondering if you have sort of theories or methodologies or maybe more broadly just thoughts about your encounter with such documents. Um, and in particular, I was thinking about my discipline, which is English literature, and the way in which scholars like Cydia Hartman have thought about um, encounters with archives that themselves contain erasures or violences. And so Hartman, you know, Hartman has this notion of critical fabulation as kind of a way to combine kind of imaginative investment with this archival encounter. So I'm curious about the way in which you're thinking about that encounter in your work. Thank you. So it's interesting. I am, a, I am perhaps more generous than most in allowing for the possibility that there is a lot of truth in colonial archives. There are indigenous scholars and indigenous knowledge keepers who just don't trust anything that's written in them, assume that they are all falsehoods and, and confabulations. But what I have found is that often they can point the way to something, even if they're fraught, even if they're violent, even if they're full of erasure. So for example, in this search for King Philip's wampum belt, people consistently turn to a single statement by Benjamin Church that indicated that when Medicom was dead, one of Medicom's chief captains, Anawan, had come to church and handed over Medicom's regalia. And that piece that existed in a colonial document was reproduced in several publications and slightly distorted to the degree where the distorted version became the one everyone held onto. And so in the distorted version, there was one wampum belt, it was stolen by church, from the dead body of King Philip and then sent to England. And none of those facts are actually in the original documents. So by going back to the original documents, what I found is that a number of colonial leaders saw King Philip, King Philip Medicom, same person, English name, native name, but saw him with his regalia with three wampum belts. So one was a collar, actually. One was across his body. And one was so long he could drape it on his shoulder and it touched the floor. All of these are significant. So there are three missing objects. And then the objects were not taken off his dead body and were not actually brought by Anawan to church, but were somehow found by church where 
Medicom had taken them off because it was traditional that when you went to battle, you took off your regalia and you went in your loincloth and maybe your leggings and your moccasins and your war club and that was it, or maybe your rifle. But you left all these things behind. So there are these details in the colonial documents that are really important clues for trying to find these objects. And one of them is so wonderful. It's a detail where a colonial observer sees Medicom years before the war and he sees him at a council meeting. And at this council meeting with multiple leaders from Nipmuc and Narragansett and several Wampanoag bands, they're all gathered together and he wants all of these people to join with him in this alliance. And he takes his coat that is laden with wampum and he cuts it up and he distributes it to each of these people. And that's a wonderful fact and a little performance of wampum distribution and kinship making that's lost if you don't go back to the colonial records. So it's not that they're the only source, but they are really valuable sources. So my, I would say my method is read everything, but read everything in as close to the original as possible. Try to find people who were eyewitnesses to what they are describing. And if they are not eyewitnesses, figure out who they're talking to so you can figure out where they get that information and what they do with it. I thought your story about the Denver Museum was really interesting about how the information that the curators had and the description that had been cataloged with that um, belt had was clearly not what was accurate. And I was wondering if, um, as a part of your research, you're helping the um, repositories to update that information about the item as well. Yeah, I am whenever possible. But I am also, and again, this will sound odd, I am an advocate of keeping the false information because it's a trail. And so it's a matter of contextualizing it. So saying, you know, this is the operative knowledge that the museum is embracing at this moment in time. Now, here's some more operative knowledge, and here's how that is informed. And then here's some more, and here, here's how that is informed. And it's one reason I'm actually very slow to publish on this research. And the reason is because in many cases, I am looking at objects that, if they are not now, will be the subject of repatriation claims. And what I like to do is to try to get the relationships clarified first before people start arguing over objects. So as much as possible, trying to make information available. So you may have noticed early on, there's a photograph of Laura Pierce and I. And it's a wonderful example of how this works. Laura is the former curator of the American collections at the Pitt Rivers Museum. She's now emeritus curator. And in this case, we are looking at Huron, Wendat, and Wyandot wampum belts at Pitt Rivers, but there has not been any consultation with Native communities until very, very recently. And so we got funding from Arts Council England to search for the lost Wampanoag wampum belts that enabled us to go back and recheck the collections of the British Museum and Pitt Rivers Museum and find other people's wampum belts that are missing and in need of attention. So I do not hesitate to use the search for one tribal nation's patrimony to locate another if it appears in front of me. And that is not typically done in this kind of research. People are usually very targeted. But I think we need to talk to each other more, quite honestly. Yeah. Is the, can you hear me OK? Yeah. It is. The description said that it was variously figured with animals and plants and human figures. And so it's literally just about complete. I don't have an image handy here to show you. But it has a pine tree in the center. And it has animals. It has um, corn growing. It has. Uh, people dancing, it has all of these events going on on either side of this belt, and then it doesn't stop. So it even stops midway through a figure dancing, and it has long strands at both ends, and the message there is that this can continue. So what they did is to create their own imaginative representation of what Metacom's belt may have looked like, but it captures their sense of themselves as a community today. And because it's so well documented, it's a case where also there will not be confusion. So it's not a replica of what was. It's not a bad copy of what was. It's a new iteration that is indigenous art. Yeah. Yeah, go for it. Um, 
So to the best of my knowledge, belts were not made for prestigious people. If they were held by prestigious people, they were held on behalf of the community. So a prominent individual might hold them or show them or display them as part of their task. So for instance, I love using this image because the 1815 Pledge of the Crown Wampum Belt was made in England to send to the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe to thank them for allying with England in the War of 1812. And hence the Pledge of the Crown is we are still with you even though this war has gone the way it has. And so when this physical belt came back, when it was repatriated to Six Nations, and this is the actual historic belt, it was so poetic to have Rick Hill, who is Tuscarora, elder, and Alan Corbier, who's an Anishinaabe elder, holding it and displaying it at this event, which is a commemoration of the 1815 Pledge of the Crown and of the Old Alliance. So this is happening now, too, is that some of these old belts made to record these relationships are actually being, are living again, are being brought to events where they are once again shown. So for example, when when the first repatriations of wampum happened in 1988 and 89, those went to the Six Nations at Grand River, and one batch went to Six Nations, and one batch went to Onondaga. But in that moment in time, just before NAGPRA, which came about in 1990, the tribal nations that received the repatriated wampum were compelled to sign agreements that they would never repair them, never replace them, always keep them in locked storage, and not bring them outside. And that's like saying, here's your child back, but you have to put it in a cage and lock it away and it can never breathe again. And so it took a while for the tribal nations to say, you know what, we're gonna violate that agreement because it's not something that is appropriate. And so now, for example, the George Washington belt, which was given to Onondaga to record the alliance of the 13 colonies with Onondaga, the Onondaga carry it to Washington whenever they feel it's necessary and say, remember this? We have an old alliance, come on, we still remember, how about you? So that's starting to happen as well. These belts that were made for those purposes are still alive and can still do that if they're shown and if they're held. And so what was like the everyday use? Wampum, if it had an everyday use, so, so wampum has really three categories of use. Everyday use as adornment, protective collars, earrings, um, bracelets on your garments. As adornment, it was widely used by men and women and children, often buried with the dead. It could have a protective and a healing effect. Then as political wampum, it could be used within tribal nations, between tribal nations, or between tribal nations and non-native nations as political records of agreements. And then wampum was also used in healing and sacred ceremonies. So some belts, which I'm not showing in any of this, were meant to only be used at spiritual events or to be brought out for particularly, well, actually, I suppose you could say the shark belt is an example of that, but it's a different cross-cultural spirituality. But they were meant to speak specifically to other than human beings. So there are more categories, but those are sort of the three basic ones. Yeah. Sure, you're welcome. All right. Um, as a token of appreciation Ooh. for your talk. And um, it's a book I do I not have. A book, Object Lessons, Wonderful. written by our former director, Carl Sinopoli, edited, yeah. and by Kirsten Barnt, and it was for the Bicentennial of the University. Beautiful. About our collections. Ah, oh, thank so, you. And thank you. thank you all for coming. Let's um, give our speaker a big round of applause. Thank you. This is lovely.